Thank you. Um, welcome. Um, I'm excited to host my first BioBytes. Um, and I'm also very, very excited to bring on Amy Thurber. Um, so Amy's background is fascinating. Um, we all know food and dietary allergies are on the rise. According to the recent data, we've got 32 million people in the US who report having a food allergy. And of course, we know anyone who suffers from these allergies uh, knows how difficult it is to find the right foods to eat, the things that make them feel good and well and vital. Um, so this is exactly why we brought Amy here today. So Amy's a, a farmer, a educator, a foodie living in the south coast of Massachusetts. When her son was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and she herself began suffering from chronic hives, Thurber discovered the healing benefits of the specific carbohydrate diet. And so she adapted it to fit her own needs and her own allergy profile. And she has shared this information in this fabulous book, which is gorgeous. So the book's called What Do You Eat? Which is a fabulous title. What do you eat? <laughs> Sourcing and cooking pure foods. Um, so in today's presentation, Amy will share her tips and her treasures related to healthy eating while avoiding those, those foods that trigger your allergy reactions. So she'll also share resources, which you can actually start today. So her valuable resources, that, which you can use to start today to go down this path of feeling great while eating really, really yummy food. So without further ado, um, I'll go ahead and take it away, Amy, and let me know. And I'll go ahead and start to, when you're ready, I'll share the screen to get your PowerPoint up. Great. Thank you. You can probably start sharing it now and we'll get, we'll get started. So I'm very happy to be here today, and I'm very interested in hearing some of the, um, the questions that you have and your food journeys and your dietary journeys with allergies. Um, I have had allergies since I was a very young child, and they have come and gone. Um, so it, it's definitely something that I have dealt with uh, lifelong, and my family tends to have allergies. Um, but it wasn't until recently that I started to have some um, sort of aha moments. And those aha moments began when my son was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, um, as Jessica said. And are we having trouble getting the PowerPoint up? Yeah, yeah. Thank you um, for picking up on that. I'm not showing it. It's showing a lot of um, triangles with exclamation marks. Okay. So, hey, stand by there. Yep. We'll stand by i'm getting i'm getting to it that's all right keep going so um one of the uh i'll sort of go through my food journey while we're while we're trying to get our powerpoint presentation up um i had a lot of um sensitivity to metals when i was young and i know a lot of people don't really think of this as food related but i'm going to just discuss it briefly because it was a mystery to me for quite a long time until i made this connection uh i would wear jewelry and I would break out with a terrible rash. Um, and it sort of went away over the years, but I, again, I was very sensitive to metals. Um, and then fast forward to 2015, um, my son was diagnosed and we heard from a friend that it was um, beneficial to use the specific carbohydrate diet for Crohn's disease. And I said, well, let's, let's all do it. Let's just all this way. And when I started to um, do some research, I found that the premise behind the specific carbohydrate diet was very good for a lot of reasons. All right. So we can just scroll through the PDFs. That's fine. Um, you just tell me when to move on. Great. Thank you. So eliminating food allergies is the title for today. Uh, that's a difficult one. I would love to say we can all eliminate food allergies, but it's not always that simple. Uh, but what we're going to discuss today is using pure foods to solve a lot of dietary um, allergy problems. So I have a couple quotes here that I used at the beginning of my cookbook, and we've all heard the quote, you are what you eat. But I actually found this quote from, I'm going to try and pronounce his name, Anthelm Brillant Savarin. And he says, tell me what you eat, and I will tell you what you are. And I think that's really beautiful because it takes it and kinds of kind of puts it back on itself and, and it makes you think to yourself, okay, well, I am the product of what I eat. 
Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson also had a nice little quote. He says, I cannot remember the books I've read more than the meals that I've eaten. Even so, they have made me. Um, I certainly remember a lot of meals that I've eaten, and I remember a lot of the books that I've read, but, um, but I do think that's a nice, uh, a nice quote. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, let me just see how I need to do that. Oop. There you go. Yep, yeah, that's okay. the one. So healing through diet is a very powerful tool. So again, when I um, discovered the specific carbohydrate diet for my son's Crohn disease, Crohn's disease, um, I realized how helpful diet is in healing. And the problem I had was when I had so many allergies, there were things I couldn't even eat on the specific carbohydrate diet. Um, so when you start eliminating foods from your diet, it can cause challenges for getting a healthy, balanced diet, but it also is very stressful. So I'm going to talk about some of the options that we can use to try and make it less stressful and help to uh, have control over what we're eating. So let's go to the next slide. So these are some of the types of food allergy reactions. Um, again, I'm, I'm talking about some of the things that can cause allergies and sometimes people have more than one allergy and they think they've got it under control and they're still having symptoms well sometimes you have to look a little deeper uh, so you can have gi stomach upset cramping cramps bloating and diarrhea those are probably some of the most common allergies related to food you can also have skin condition problems like rashes and hives and itching and swelling i actually have uh, chronic hives so i have hives almost every single day uh, and my process is to try and reduce the hives, which I'm actually getting a lot of success at, which is making me very happy after all these years. Uh, respiratory issues like stuffy nose and difficulty breathing can actually be related to food. Um, those I've never experienced, but I feel sorry for those that do have that, um, that problem. Swelling of the face and mouth is called angioedema. And again, if, if you have this problem, I really feel for you. I suffer from this and it is going away. And um, I found that it made my life very challenging from the point of view of going out into the world and doing what I needed to do. Because when I had a swollen face, um, swollen eyes, swollen mouth, I couldn't always drive. Um, I felt very awkward about being in public and um, it's a really difficult condition. So when you get angioedema, um, you definitely need to really try and get some answers. Okay, next slide. How to determine what you're allergic to? Um, allergy testing. Uh, I've used functional medicine practitioners. They've been very helpful at doing very specific testing that goes above and beyond what an allergist can do. And the elimination diet. And if you're not familiar with that, it's basically using um, your diet to try and determine what you're allergic to by eliminating your most likely um, possibilities. So if you feel you have certain triggers that you're suspecting, um, like dairy, grain, um, nightshades, or chocolate, or whatever it is, you go without those things for two weeks, sometimes three weeks, see if those symptoms start to abate. If they do, that's great. You've hit on something. And then you start reintroducing one thing at a time for say two or three days. And it's very tricky because you want to actually have quite a bit of that one thing. If you think you might be allergic to chocolate, don't just have one little tiny piece of chocolate to see whether you're reacting. Have a whole chocolate bar. And then if you have a reaction, great. If you don't have a reaction, keep eating that one chocolate bar for the next two or three days because sometimes there is a delayed reaction. Um, then if that doesn't seem to be a trigger, you can continue eating it and start to reintroduce the next item. So elimination diet is actually a very helpful tool and it's something you can do yourself, but it's always good to use um, a medical practitioner, a functional medicine doctor or some other type of um, practitioner to guide you and try and come up with what you're going to eliminate. Next slide. These are some of the types of testings that I have undergone. Um, there's skin, pr skin prick testing, which is the most common and it's done by allergists. Um, it can be very helpful for a lot of um, allergies that you might be in contact with by um, either inhaling or contact. So for instance, it's used a lot for respiratory allergies like pollen, um, dog and cat fur and so on. Um, 
skin patch testing goes one step beyond that. It actually is taking those allergens and putting them on your skin, many times your back or your stomach, um, in patches. And they're left on there for several days. And then when they're removed, then they're um, analyzed over a certain length of time to see whether you're getting a reaction to any of those items. That was very helpful for me. ELISA blood testing, and that is uh, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. And this is where they're actually taking a sample of your blood and then exposing it to different allergens to see if there's a reaction. That can be helpful, although occasionally it can be a little bit misleading. Applied kinesi uh, kinesiology is muscle testing, and this is done by taking a sample of the possible allergen and putting it in proximity to your body and then testing your reaction um, through muscle uh, reaction. It's, it's an interesting technique, and it was actually helpful for, um, for me and my son. Lactose hydrogen breath test. If you suspect you're allergic to lactose, they may give you a lactose hydrogen breath test. It involves um, taking a small sample of your um, breath at the beginning before you've had anything to eat and then you digest some lactose and then they continue monitoring your hydrogen level in your breath until um, a certain amount of time has passed and they can determine whether or not you're having difficulty um, digesting lactose now what was interesting is my son had one of these tests and his hydrogen level was very high at the beginning of the test and it never changed and this was actually an example of a SIBO uh, problem, so small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, so there is also a test for that, but this helped us to kind of clue into the fact that he wasn't allergic to lactose, he had bacterial overgrowth. Next slide. So many um, specialists out there uh, can be very helpful to your quest for your uh, cause of your allergies, allergists, functional medical practitioners, uh, medicine practitioners, dietitians and nutritionists, um, homeopathic practitioners, and applied kinesiology. Next slide. So some of the solutions um, that I have found very helpful, again, the elimination diet, the anti-inflammatory diet, and this usually involves eliminating things like nightshades, grain, sugars, and so on. Um, this is the first step that I took, and it was helpful, but I didn't solve my problems. The specific carbohydrate diet is one of the things we're going to talk about in depth today, and that is a lot more um, rigid than the anti-inflammatory diet as far as what you cannot eat, but it's very, very um, beneficial. The paleo diet is very similar to the specific carbohydrate diet. However, it allows certain things that the specific carbohydrate di diet does not. So we'll go over that later. The keto diet is really great for losing weight, um, but it may not be the best thing for uh, allergies. Next slide, please. So I talked a little bit about my dietary journey uh, at the beginning. And I'm going to just say that this photo here is the first meal that we had when we were on the uh, specific carbohydrate diet. So my son and I um, just started for lunch uh, in 2015, and we had some brie, which again, later on I found was probably not the best choice for cheese, but it's what I had in the fridge. And we had smoked trout, and the smoked trout is basically just trout with salt that's been smoked. Very simple ingredients. We had dried blueberries, which did not have any sugar. Um, the apple slices were for the brie, so that's a wonderful combination with cheese if you can have dairy products. And the cucumber slices were for the uh, smoked trout, and then we had some pecans on the side. Um, so you can see, you can basically shop and leave these things in your fridge, and you can put together a meal that's extremely healthy and very satisfying very quickly. Okay, next slide, please. So these are the principles of the specific carbohydrate diet that we're gonna talk about. Um, Elaine Gottesall wrote a book called Breaking the Vicious Cycle, Intestinal Health Through Diet. And she was the person that really brought this diet into um, the limelight, but it was already developed and it was already being practiced before she wrote this book. The basic premise behind it is you're resetting your good bacteria by starving out the bad gut bacteria. It's as simple as that. Um, reducing inflammation and healing the gut and the immune system comes through 
getting rid of this gut, this bad gut bacteria. So um, the the thing that makes this such an incredible tool is that you have the ability to heal your gut by eating certain foods. And this addresses so many issues between SIBO and um, Crohn's disease and a lot of other dietary problems, but it also can help with allergies. So next slide, please. So these are the different types of carbohydrates. There are monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. Monosaccharides are very simple sugars that, that are comprised of a single um, sugar molecule or saccharide molecule. And those can be things like honey and fruit, and sometimes vegetables will have monosaccharides. Disaccharides are two saccharide molecules, and they have a bond, so it's a little bit harder to actually break that bond and digest it, but it gives you energy. So disaccharides are things like sugars um, and some other starch, some other things that aren't starches, uh, like uh, high fructose corn syrup and rice sugar and um, things like that. They are disaccharides. Polysaccharides are starches. They are long chains of saccharide molecules. So you actually have to use, um, they, they take a lot more energy to uh, break down, but then it gives you more energy. So polysaccharides are something that's sort of the basis of the American diet, wheats, uh, corn grains, and uh, a lot of starchy vegetables like potatoes um, are all polysaccharides. Now, why is honey different? Honey has been altered by the bees. So it's taking that uh, nectar and actually almost like not digesting it, but it's altering it to a point where it's very easy for us to digest. But also honey can have some problems if you have a lot of um, immune problems. If you're a young child or you're a mother that's pregnant and breastfeeding, you have to be careful about not having honey. Next slide, please. So this is the vicious cycle that uh, is discussed in Elaine Gottesall's um, book. So usually it starts with injury to the small intestinal surface. Now this can be from uh, a disease like Crohn's disease or uh, IBS, irritable bowel, irritable bowel syndrome, um, but it can also be from other causes. Now in my case, I believe my injury occurred from having antibiotics from um, tick-borne illness. And this can cause an injury to the intestinal lining, which then starts this cycle. It can also be caused by food allergies. So if you have something that you're not tolerating in your diet, it can cause some um, damage to the intestinal lining. And this starts this cycle. So once you've got the damage, then you have impaired digestion of disaccharides. So the disaccharides, remember, are um, sugar, table sugar, high fructose corn syrup, and so on. It also includes polysaccharides, but for her um, explanation, she's talking about disaccharides. So then that causes malabsorption of the disaccharides, which means now they're floating around in your digestive tract and causing bacterial overgrowth because the bad bacteria feed off of the disaccharides and the polysaccharides. So if you're not digesting them, they're there and they're fueling this problem. So this increases the bacterial byproducts, which makes more mucus production and causes more injury to the small intestine. So you can see where we're going with this. This is a cycle that feeds on itself. Once you're no longer digesting the disaccharides and the polysaccharides, you end up with more and more bacterial overgrowth, which is causing more and more injury to the small intestinal surface. Next slide, please. So what to eat? So you can eat most vegetables, you can eat almost all fruits, you can eat all seafoods, all meats and eggs. If you're not allergic to them, you can eat nuts and naturally cultured yogurt and some cheeses. So again, I'll give you some resources to look at for um, identifying foods that you can eat. Uh, so when I say most vegetables, there are some exceptions, but on a whole, this is a really healthy diet. And I remember asking uh, my son's pediatrician when we were on this diet for a while, is this okay to keep doing this? And she said, are you kidding? You're eating exactly what you should be eating. Next slide, please. So these are photos from the cookbook. Um, so when you have breakfast, you're breaking 
a fast, right? So you're basically giving your body the signal to change from fasting, which is when you're sleeping, to eating. And a nutritionist years ago um, told me that one of the things that was um, helpful for her was that the first thing you eat in, in at the beginning of the day when you break your, your fast is what your body's going to crave for the rest of the day. So why would you want to eat a starchy, sugary thing like cereal? No, you want to eat protein. You want to eat something that's really healthy. So breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Next slide, please. Uh, many times at lunch, I'll have a soup or a salad, and these are things that I can prepare ahead of time and bring with me if I need to. Um, it's very quick and easy. Uh, once you make a large pot of soup, you can have it over many, many days. Next slide, please. Proteins. Um, most of our meals at the end of the day are protein based. Uh, we're going to be fasting from supper until breakfast. And again, I'll talk a little bit about fasting if you'd like later on. Um, but it's good to have a nice, uh, solid protein filled uh, meal at the end of the day. Next slide, please. And of course, you can have dessert and snacks. Um, so these are all based on honey for sweetening or fruit for sweetening. Um, most of them are non dairy, although you can use dairy products if you're not, um, if you don't have a dairy intolerance. For grain, um, there are absolutely no grains. There are either seed based uh, or nut based flours. So the um, most of these have things like coconut flour, uh, ground flax meal, um, ground sunflowers for flour. And if you can tolerate nuts, you can use things like almond flour, pecan flour, hazelnut flour, chestnut flour, and so on. So it's very, um, it's very exciting to experiment with some of these new ingredients because they taste great. Next slide, please. So these are some of the things to avoid. All sugars except for honey and fruits. All grains. I know that sounds hard, but it's really not. Once you get going, you're fine, you feel great, and you want to keep doing it. You want to avoid starchy vegetables like potatoes, corn, and most dried beans, except for navy beans. Navy beans are actually a little different in the way their carbohydrate to um, fiber content is, and they actually can be tolerated once you get going on this. You should avoid all dairy products except for yogurt and some cultured cheeses. So the culturing um, eliminates the lactose, and it also makes it a lot more digestible. I have recommended eliminating all processed foods and thickeners. So things like carrageenan and um, a lot of the things that are starch that thicken food like soups um, are definitely something you want to avoid. Next slide. So these are some of your new ingredients here that you can, <laughs> that you can pick from. Um, these are available at most grocery stores. And if they're not at a grocery store, try a health food store. Um, there are a lot of resources out there for getting some of these ingredients. Now, my most important message is to read the labels. The fewer ingredients, it's easier to control what you're eating. Um, so that's what pure foods means. It means single ingredient foods. And if you can stock your kitchen with things like this, you have everything you need to be able to cook. And again, a lot of this involves cooking, but you can also do what I did on my first meal, which was basically stock your fridge with single um, single ingredient foods that are already prepared and eat those. Next slide. So there are some similarities um, to this. The specific carbohydrate diet has some similarities to the paleo diet, uh, but there are also some differences. So first, we're going to talk about the similarities. Um, both avoid grains and most sugars. So that's great. The paleo diet also avoids nightshades. That's also great because that's going to eliminate a lot of inflammatory ingredients in your diet. Now, this includes tomatoes and um, potatoes, which we're not going to eat anyway because they're too starchy. Um, and some pe sometimes peppers can cause problems. So if you're starting this out, I would sort of go that route just to be safe. You can always try reintroducing them later and see how you do. The paleo diet allows some starchy vegetables like cassava, potato, and tapioca. So I would avoid those if possible. The paleo diet allows maple syrup, 
date and coconut sugar. Now these are polysaccharides. So you really have to be careful, even though they're very natural sugars. Um, it's a good idea when you're starting out just to uh, steer clear of those. The paleo diet allows chocolate. I'm allergic to chocolate. <laughs> so it, I have been using carob powder as my substitute, which has been very, um, very delicious. Uh, but it's also a bean. And I found later that uh, beans are very high in nickel. So I've been avoiding that. Um, the paleo diet avoids all dairy products. So again, it's a little different. Um, that can be helpful for some people. Next slide, please. This is um, an example of how to read the recipes in my cookbook if you choose to get it. And a lot of cookbooks use these keys. So I thought I should at least show you some of this. Um, this the key on the left-hand side um, in dark green shows all of the different target um, priorities that you might be looking for when you're looking through the recipes. So if you're looking for a specific carbohydrate diet recipe, there you go. You have some options. So below in the light green, you have options for making it specific carbohydrate diet friendly. It's a paleo diet um, soup and it's gluten free and grain free. So GF in my case means both. It's nut free. It has dairy free options and it has a vegetarian option. So if you're a vegetarian, you can um, certainly find a lot of ways to use this diet as well. Next slide, please. I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. There's no cheating. If you really want this to succeed, you need to stick with it. And if you say to yourself, oh, I can't do that. I'm not even going to try. All I can say is I walk around and I see people at the grocery store reaching into the case that has the donuts. And I don't even want to look. I don't even want to touch a donut. I have no interest in <laughs> things that are sugary or full of wheat anymore because I feel great and it's something that you're going to you're going to have to realize by doing that if you try this and it's successful you're going to feel so good that you're going to say I wish I'd started this before um, so occasionally eating a donut or a sugary treat or something like that is actually going to set you back because it takes almost a month for you to reset reset your gut bacteria to, um, to get rid of that bad bacteria. So it really helps if you can stick with it. Allergies are the same issue. Uh, when you have a food allergy uh, or an intolerance to certain foods, if you have those, then you can end up causing this uh, spiral of problems in the damage to the intestines that can cause, again, about a month to recoup from. So it's a good idea to just commit yourself and say, okay, I'm gonna start this today and I'm gonna stick with it and see where it takes me and I do hope it helps. Next slide, please. So sourcing pure foods. Um, there are so many wonderful ways to find food. Um, if you live in an area where you don't have access to a lot of um, fresh fruits and vegetables and so on, uh, farmer's markets are an awesome way to go if you can get to a farmer's market. Um, but I find that Growing my own food has been really very, very helpful to me. So a lot of people can't do that. There are, uh, what do they call it? Community gardens that, that you can join. So almost all cities now have uh, access to community gardens, even if they're on the rooftop of a building. Um, so certainly it's, it's fun and very helpful to try and find new sources for food. Um, so see what you can see what you can do. There are also farm shares and sometimes a CSA will actually bring their foods into a city and have a drop off day once a week where you can actually order these things and then they get dropped off and you pick up your farm share and you have fresh fruits and vegetables all week. Food cooperatives are also a really helpful tool. So if you have difficulty finding certain ingredients in your local stores, you can join or start a food cooperative and it basically just allows you to um, order foods in a group setting from wholesalers that have these different uh, foods available and growing your own. Next slide, please. So here's a picture of my garden. Um, I'm very lucky. I have a great, uh, a great yard for gardening. Next slide, please. 
So another thing I want to encourage you to do is enjoy cooking. Um, and even if you are not a great cook, um, you can see here, this is basically just a salad with some things that I had in jars that I threw on top and a, uh, some grilled chicken. Um, I made my own mango salsa and that's actually yellow carrots, which is kind of fun. Um, so again, I just boiled some carrots and put them on the plate and that was our meal. So experiment, experimenting with new ingredients can be a lot of fun. Um, trying new recipes is wonderful and then sharing the results is a lot of fun too. Next slide, please. Um, this is the cover of the cookbook that I wrote. Um, it has no grains, um, no sugars, no gluten, no nuts, no dairy, no starchy vegetables. Um, there are a lot of wonderful cookbooks out there um, that also cover the same things. The thing that's different about what I've done is I've, I've basically tailored the specific carbohydrate diet to eliminate things like nuts uh, because I can't tolerate nuts. And um, that changes quite a bit of the baked goods and, um, and some of the other recipes because nut flour is really key to the specific carbohydrate diet recipes that I have found um, in regular cookbooks. So it has changed some of the, um, the premise behind how you're treating it, uh, but I have found it to be very helpful. And the cookbook is available through Amazon and local bookstores, and uh, it is available internationally as well through Amazon. Next slide, please. So I wish everyone good health and happy eating. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, so I know I'm happy to talk about the things that are, are uh, interesting or interested that all of the people in our audience are interested in. Thank you, Amy, that was awesome. Um, yes, we had some great questions. So some some of the questions that came in beforehand, I can get to get to those right now. Um, so does this have anything to do with leaky gut, or does that that type of diet contribute to leaky gut, or what would you say to that? Absolutely, um, leaky gut is if people aren't familiar with it, it's basically uh, where your your gut has larger gaps in it um, than it should. So normally you should be absorbing these nutrients through your gut, which is usually in the intestinal lining. Um, and the holes are small enough so that only the things that you're um, absorbing get, get into the, uh, the bloodstream. But with leaky gut, you have larger holes and toxins and other things can get into your bloodstream, which can cause a lot of problems. So the, the healing the gut basically is the key to everything. So when you have damage to your intestinal lining, um, if you can start by eliminating the cause of that damage, uh, either by eliminating the food that you're allergic to or reacting to, or just plain starving out that bad gut bacteria so that your intestinal lining can heal, um, that's really a, a very powerful tool to be able to heal your gut. So what specifically do you know of particular foods that might help heal that? Um, well, it's more what you avoid. Okay. So I think avoiding grains, sugars, and dairy products are really the most important things to, to be able to start that process. Um, but from what I understand, there are certain foods that are helpful. Um, I'm not familiar with what they are, but certainly this diet covers a lot of those foods. So... Uh, but I think it's the eliminating of the, the sugar, the grain, and the dairy that really would be the most beneficial in that case. All right. What about eating for particular autoimmune disorders? Do you have any experience with that? Yes. Um, now, again, I'm not a medical practitioner. <laughs> These are just my own experiences that I'm using for, uh, for my uh, information. But uh, with my son's uh, Crohn's disease, that's an autoimmune disorder. And because your gut is where your immune system is based, so your, um, your immune system is very, very reliant on healthy uh, gut. So in other words, if you heal the gut, you're going to be eliminating a lot of the problems with your immune system because your immune system is going to get regulated through the healing of the gut. So from, from my experience, especially with Crohn's disease, um, 
once you've got that damage, then it perpetuates this inflammation and creates more and more of a problem with your uh, immune system. So it's very, very important to just start by healing the gut and then a lot of those things will, will correct themselves. But again, when you have an autoimmune disease, that's never gonna go away. But if you can try and regulate it by healing your gut, it will make a huge difference. Okay, awesome. So thank you. I have another one here. Um, what about fermented foods? Um, are those good to reset the gut or intestines? There's a lot of debate about that. A lot of people have said yes, um, because it's full of prebiotics and a lot of things that are gonna help with that. However, when you are digesting um, fermented foods, sometimes you can end up with some byproducts that can cause issues. And so I would give it a try. You might find it very, very helpful. You may not. Uh, another thing is probiotics. So probiotics um, can also be very beneficial. However, you have to get a good probiotic because many times when you're eating, uh, say for instance, yogurt, um, sure that has a lot of great probiotics in it, but once it gets into your stomach acid, a lot of those probiotics are killed off. So mm -hmm. things like fermented, fo fermented foods and um, probiotics and so on have to actually get through your stomach acid to your small intestine to be beneficial. So there are a lot of enterically coated uh, probiotics, which are great because they actually don't release until they get into your intestines. Um, so I think it's definitely something that um, fermented foods can be a great resource mm -hmm. for getting those uh, probiotics and prebiotics, but you have to do it carefully. So give it a try, see if you can tolerate them. Can you give us some examples of some fermented foods? I love sauerkraut. So I actually have some naturally fermented beet sauerkraut that I buy at our local grocery store and health food store. Um, so it's beets that have been um, fermented and it's really just beets and salt and water, I think. Uh, but beets are also great because they are very helpful for detoxing. So I really love this, um, this beet, beet sauerkraut, cabbage sauerkraut, um, kimchi, all of those things um, do the same thing and they're, they're really beneficial. Um, okay, one more question here from the chat. What are the steps to starting a food co-op? Great question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's a good question. I joined one, so I was very fortunate because it was already there, but we've had to, um, we've had to adjust and build it over many years. So the first step is basically just to get a group of people together that are like-minded that want to find resources for um, healthy foods. And it can be as simple as buying um, meat from a local farm or even a farm that you know that you know you might have to drive an hour away to get to get your 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 supply. But if you can do things as a group, you tend you tend to be able to get things at a discounted rate. Um, so our food co-op uses United Natural Foods Incorporated for uh, our basic month to month orders. And we're able to order a lot of really great things in bulk. And we can order cases of foods that are usually only available at health food stores. So there's a discount um, for ordering from a food co-op for a lot of these uh, companies. They have many different um, companies out there that actually supply food cooperatives. So you can do a lot of research and just find one that delivers in your area. Our food co-op is actually um, based in Providence, but we get our deliveries out of Connecticut. So this truck comes from Connecticut uh, on a Thursday morning, once a month, and it delivers to all of the local health food stores. And then we end up um, getting our delivery. So it's, it's a wonderful resource. We've actually branched out from there and we now do group seed orders um, from FETCO, which is a uh, organic seed um, grower. And we also do orders from Frontier Herbs, which is a wholesaler, but they also supply a lot of grocery stores and so on. So we can get a lot of fabulous uh, bulk foods from them. And Equal Exchange, which is another great um, organization that is basically trying to uh, create sustainable agriculture and farming in different parts of the world, and then bring it into um, 
to their company to be able to market it to people that are interested in find in finding foods that are sustainably raised and ethically grown. So there are a lot of different avenues. Basically, the first step I would say would be to get the group together, open a joint bank account where one person or two people can have access to that account. And then when you place an order, you order through that account and then everybody puts their money into the account. So, you know, it's almost like a small business. Very simple, though. We have an annual meeting every year. It's very casual. Um, but when somebody says, hey, I found this awesome resource, anybody want to order from it? Then it just starts that, you know, chain of events that that helps our co-op grow. Wow, that is fascinating. <laughs> Um, okay, next question. Um, in your book, if you have eliminated nut flowers, are there any other flower alternatives to use? And I think you mentioned some like, um, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so this, this was basically the key to what makes this cookbook in particular different um, than all the other specific carbohydrate, car carbohydrate diet and paleo diet cookbooks. So in my case, I'm allergic to nuts and it's the nickel in the nuts that I'm allergic to. Although I also have had reactions to things like cashews and so on. So if you're eliminating the nut flowers, what do you have as an option? Coconut flour is usually very well absorbed. So most people can tolerate uh, coconut. It, it has the word nut in it, but it's not a coconut. I mean, it's not a nut, it's, it's a, a fruit. Um, there are a lot of other flowers that are used in the paleo diet, which I would steer away from, like plantain flour and cassava flour and potato flour. Those actually are very starchy. They have the polysaccharides that can cause a lot of problems. So what I've done is I have used um, sunflower meal and sometimes chia seeds and uh, flax meal. So flax meal is something that is really helpful to me because it adds some bulk and fiber to my diet um, that's very healthy, but it doesn't seem to bother my um, intestinal lining. But if you do have true Crohn's disease or IBS or something like that, I would be very cautious about introducing any seed or nut, um, in, uh, not nut, I'm sorry, any seed uh, flour into your diet. Those tend to cause some irritation if you are dealing with um, a true disease of the gut. So I would be careful about that. But there, there are some great alternatives um, if you don't have that problem so that you can have a lot of these baked goods without using nuts. Um, one other thing that um, I haven't really gotten into is beans. So bean flour can be really helpful if it's lentil flour or pea flour or um, white bean flour. So you have to be careful what the source of the bean is. Things like um, garbanzo beans are very, very uh, starchy and you have to be really careful about those. But I've made pasta with uh, green pea flour that has been awesome. And I end up uh, looking for sprouted flowers. So if you can find pea flour that's sprouted, that is, far superior. Um, lentil pasta most of the time has not been sprouted. So I would steer away from that until you get going on this because sometimes that can cause some problems. Um, the starches are just not, it, it has, it has issues. Uh, but if you have sprouted bean flour, it's really, really healthy and very nutritious. Awesome. Great. Okay. From Glenn, do you lump food allergies and food sensitivities together or consider them separate? Just curious, the general look, looks like the diet would help both, right? So yes. sensitivities. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think the thing that's so challenging when you talk about allergies is um, when you have a true allergic reaction to something, it's very, it's very clearly a reaction, you know, in other words, if I have um, something that I know I'm allergic to, I'm allergic to citrus fruit. If I use citrus uh, soap, for instance, when I'm away, my hands swell up. Um, it's, it's dramatic, you know, so that's an allergic reaction. But intolerances are something that sometimes can come and go. 
So I've had intolerances to certain things and then I find, hey, I'm no longer reacting to those. Um, so I do lump them together when I talk about what I'm, um, what I'm avoiding in the sidebar of the recipes. And it just makes it a lot easier. It's really difficult to differentiate between an allergy and an intolerance. But I would say allergies are a lot more serious than intolerances. Yeah, when you have an allergic reaction, you know it. <laughs> okay, um, let's see from Linda. Can you talk about any food allergies or diet connections to migraines and Parkinson's? Mm. So it's two separate, migraines or Parkinson's? Well, that I am not familiar with. However, I have found um, that eliminating grains is and sugar is huge for my brain function. So it's something that uh, has definitely been discussed as far as um, gut belly, you know, wheat belly. I, I know there's a book about um, how you can eliminate a lot of brain fog by eliminating wheat and sugar. Uh, so that's something that's a connection that you definitely should look into a lot more. I don't know about Parkinson's and um, brain function as much as I should, but I would definitely say that would be something to explore. Okay, thank you. And one more regarding the flour question. So coconut flour cannot be used as a one-to-one -one ratio to regular flour, is that correct? That's correct. It just... it... <laughs> Remember when we used to make wheat paste for uh... Yeah, paper mache and so on. If you just add that one little bit too much flour, it just goes into a mass. That's what coconut flour does. So I would say it's like half coconut flour to flour ratio. Wow. In other words, half of the amount of coconut flour to what you would normally use for regular flour. It's really difficult to take a standard recipe and convert it to wow. this diet. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. Please try. I mean, that's how I've learned is by experimenting. But the ratio of flour to, to coconut flour is one aspect, but if you just use all coconut flour, it tends to be very gritty. Um, and things like flax meal act almost like gluten um, in that they create this gelatinous uh, effect and it helps to bind things together and it makes things a lot more um, similar to what, you're, what you would be used to in a regular muffin, for instance, or cake. Um, at the same time, coconut flour um, is, is something that you have to be just careful of when you, when you make that conversion, because if you just leave, say, for instance, the recipe as two eggs and a half a cup of coconut flour and, a, you know, half a cup of whatever you're going to use, coconut oil or butter or whatever, you're going to end up with something really dry. So a lot of these recipes for baked goods have a lot of eggs. And if you're allergic to eggs, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but it is actually producing a baked good that's very high in protein because you have, say for instance, six eggs, half a cup of coconut flour, a half a cup of whatever fat you're going to use, and about a quarter of a cup of flax meal. That's the basic that's the basic key to a lot of these baked goods, a lot of eggs, and they create volume, they create protein, they, they create moisture, and it binds everything together. And it actually makes them very um, satisfying because you can have one muffin and it keeps you going for another hour or two. It's awesome. Oh, great. Okay. So one really good question, um, liquids, drinks, beverages, what about coffee and tea? Are these off limits? <laughs> Uh, yeah, Caffeine. You know, it's a tough one. Um, it depends on what you're doing. If you're trying to uh, heal your gut for, again, a disease, a, an issue where it's true, truly a disease of the gut. Yes, you have to eliminate coffee and tea. However, if you're doing this for allergies and other benefits, health benefits, um, I would say tea might be okay. Coffee, it really just depends on, on a lot of factors. So coffee is a bean. Um, for me, it would be impossible to have coffee because it's very high in nickel. Um, but it also is very acidic. And so that can cause some issues with your gut. 
Um, so there, I would do it with caution. You know, it's one of those things that if you have a lot of coffee, just cut down on the coffee. Instead of four cups a day, have one cup a day and see what happens. You might say, hey, I feel better. Um, it is difficult to cut off completely, immediately. I know, I get that. But um, I would definitely say try avoiding it. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, checking in on our time. So we're still great. We have um, about five minutes or so left. Um, how do you feel about oatmeal? It is on a lot of healthy, low-carb diets. This is from Margie. Oatmeal, I would not recommend. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so again, if you look at that, if you look at that vicious cycle that we that we were um, addressing earlier, the the problem with oatmeal is that it's a starch, and it's going to feed that bad gut bacteria. So to start off with a diet, um, I would definitely avoid oatmeal, and if you can, avoid all grains for one month and see how you feel. And just like with the elimination diet, try reintroducing something and see how it affects you. So introduce one new thing at a time. Um, but again, oatmeal is a grain and it's, it's got starches that can cause um, bacterial overgrowth problems. Okay, all right. Um, another question, do you have recommendations for diverticulosis or diverticulitis outside of say fiber? Well, my mother had that issue. Um, again, it's something that there are a lot of triggers for diverticulitis that aren't related to the specific carbohydrate diet. So I'd say it's fairly separate. Um, so definitely avoiding um, grains and sugars, I would, I would assume would be very beneficial. But again, I'm not that, um, I'm not that familiar with what they recommend, but it would be very different as far as the goals. So I would say, do your own research on that one. Sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Um, so I'm quite curious. So with people kind of having busy schedules, busy lifestyles, what might you suggest to put in an on the go snack bag? Like what's good to have on the go when you're, oh my God, I'm starving or your day gets away from you and you don't have time to cook from scratch. A big Absolutely. Flour. Okay. Um, there are certainly some grab and go things that you can get. Um, I'm actually finding a lot more pack prepackaged snack foods that fit the bill. So beet chips um, are great. Uh, so it's basically, you know, instead of a potato chip, it's using a beet. Um, there are actually chips that are made out of uh, just Parmesan cheese. So if you can tolerate dairy, um, they're really crunchy and they have that salty crunch that's very satisfying with protein. Um, but I, for my grab and go, I love things like um, dried fruit bars. So in other words, um, I'll get some um, bars that are just dried banana, just dried mango, just dried pineapple, uh, and they're packaged already and it's really easy. Um, I also like things like jerky. You have to be careful with jerky. You really have to read the ingredients because sometimes they have sugar um, and lactose. So it's something you have to kind of be careful. Don't just grab jerky because it's there, you know, read the ingredients. Um, but I'm a big apple lover. So I will grab an apple I, if I'm heading out the door and I'm hungry. Um, and again, having baked goods that you've made ahead of time. Uh, in my cookbook, I have a recipe for apricot sunflower bars and they have sunflower butter, uh, coconut, chia seeds, honey, and apricots. Um, and it's just very simple. It's almost like a, a little energy bar. You can just grab that and take it with you. Wow, that's great. That's very helpful. Um, let's see, I think that's about it. That actually wraps it up from the questions, both the previous questions before and the ones from in the chat. So um, yeah, we want to say thank you to Amy for being here today and sharing her beautiful presentation and her knowledge and her journey. Um, we have an upcoming BioBytes. It's been dropped in the chat from Chris. Uh, it's gonna be great. It's got a catchy title, Winter Mold, Forgotten But Not Gone. So that's talking about mold toxicity. Um, is there anything else we need to cover, Liz, that we haven't? 
No, we're good. Okay, good. Thank you everyone for participating today. It was wonderful to be here. It was wonderful to have Amy here. Um, and you'll get a, actually the follow-up email in about a week's time that's going to contain all the information that Amy brought forward today, plus um, extra things to the audio version of this presentation, plus um, some synopsis with notes and resources. Remember the resources I mentioned? So all of that is going to come to you guys in your inbox in about a week's time. So um, I highly recommend the book. Yes. You better yes. coaching it. <laughs> I have it, used it. I highly recommend it. Um, we'll make sure that that's in the resources too, that you can, you can access Amy's book. It's, it's well worth it. And she told me the, just the other day, yeah, she has all of the print, all the pictures are hers and the pottery is, those are her, her dishes. She yeah. made them. She's amazing. Yeah. That's so cool. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Thanks for allowing me to share this with everyone. Yeah, awesome. It's great. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.